chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and think of that holy night that was just sung about when Jesus was born. Luke chapter 2, when you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's word. And we'll look at Luke chapter 2, and this morning we're just going to look at the first seven verses, and then tonight we'll pick it up at verse 8 and go down to verse 20. But this morning, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, onto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this morning as we think of the Christmas story and Jesus Christ coming into this world to save sinners, Lord. We're so thankful that he came to save each one of us here. I pray, Lord, that as we look at these verses this morning, I ask that you'll fill us with your, that the Spirit will work in each one of us. I pray that uh, if there's someone here that's not saved, I pray that that won't be saved this morning. And I pray, Lord, that each, each one that knows you, that this morning, their hearts will be drawn closer to you, and that they'll be made more like our Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> there is a story of a father who decided that Christmas was going to be different this year. And so he called for a family conference and challenged his family to be more disciplined in the management of their time during the Christmas season. They had to curtail excessive spending on gifts. He, talked about their relations between visiting relatives and a more congenial atmosphere around their home. And he brought his speech to a grand crescendo and he said, let's make this the best Christmas ever. And then his second grade son countered his, his motivational speech by saying, but dad, I don't see how we could ever improve on the first Christmas. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? We love Christmas, but that's because of the first Christmas. We're so thankful for the day Jesus came into this world. As you read the Christmas story in the Word of God, our hearts rejoice. This story has encouraged saints for the last 2,000 years. Jesus is born. Because of that, there is hope. Because of that, there is joy. Because of that, there is salvation. Because of that, there's eternal life. And today, let's just take some time to go through the Christmas story. This morning, we're going to look at these first seven verses, and tonight we'll look at the next 13 verses as we look at Luke chapter 2 this morning. And the first thing I want you to see as we look at these verses today, number one is the authenticity of the story. The authenticity of the Christmas story. The fact is, the Christmas story is not a fable. It's not a made-up event. The story of the Jesus Christ coming into this world, it's a, it, it's a well-documented historical fact. And in these verses, we see the authenticity of the story. Uh, Luke, the gospel writer, he is determined to not just tell you the story, but tell you when it happened. He documented. They consider Luke to be a historian. And so when you look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Luke tells you when it happened. First of all, he relates it to a historical event. Uh, verse number 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. A historical event. <laughs> Not one we like to think of. 
but taxes. They say that there's only two things you can count on in life, death and taxes. And here in the Christmas story, there are taxes. And Luke is talking, writing this event down, and he's saying to those that are reading it, they'd remember this event. They were alive. Many of them would have been alive when this happened. They can remember back in that time, or maybe if they can heard their parents talking about that time when Caesar Augustus gave this massive decree and told us all we had to go to our hometowns, our home cities, and pay taxes. It was an actual historical event. And that was the time when Jesus was born. You know, it's encouraging to know that when we're just going through the mundane things of life, like paying taxes, or just doing the little things of life, it's encouraging to know that even then, God is at work. God is at work in this world. There they were paying their taxes, not paying attention to what was going on around them, not having any idea what was happening in Bethlehem that day. But at that time, God was working out his plan of redemption, sending the Savior into the world. It's an historical event, but also he proves his point, proves this to be a true story by relaying a historical figure. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Luke has to tell us who was governor in Syria because there were two taxes. There was two times that Caesar did this kind of thing. It's believed he did it again about 10 years later. And in the book of Acts, that's what Luke's referring to when he speaks of another census, another taxing. But here he says he's, he's pinpointing the date. He's telling us this happened when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Remember when he was governor? That's when this happened. And with the mention of Cyrenius, he's telling us when it happened. And anybody who knows that history can tell you when that was. Uh, even back then, you know, they kept record of dates. They kept record of time. They knew when someone was king and the years of their reign. They knew what was going on around the world at the same time. And so even in those days, people that kept account of those things could look at them. And if Luke was a fraud, as some suggest, if he was trying to write something to try to make it look like Jesus was the Son of God, when he was in fact another man, as scoffers tell us, if he was doing that, he never would have been so precise. And so it makes it easy in these verses to tell whether or not he's telling the truth because he gives us little facts like this, even the date when Jesus was born. And the fact that he was born when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, that's when it happened. The funny thing is about this is there were people that came along and said, well, actually, uh, Cyrenius wouldn't have been governor of Syria at that time. It would have been 10 years later that Cyrenius was, Cyrenius was governor. See, you see, the, the Bible isn't true. You, you can't trust it. Well, actually, then they dug a little deeper, and they found, discovered some new coins, if you will. And they discovered in history that Cyrenius was actually governor of Syria two times. One time, the time people were thinking of, and the other time, right when Luke says he should have been, when Jesus was born. There's no error, there's no inaccuracies in the words spoken by God himself. And these verses remind us that the Bible is true. The Bible, it's never been refuted. Every word of God is true. You can, you can hang your hat on the word of God. You know, we live in a world where uh, men aren't always truthful. Uh, faithful men are hard to find, but God's word is always true. You can always trust what God has written. You can rely on it. But I also think when I think of the authenticity of the story, think of how it reminds us that he's authentic. You know what it means when you say that someone's authentic? You're saying they're real. They're, 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 they're genuine. They are what they say they are. Jesus Christ is authentic. He is who he says he is. He does what he says he does. You can trust him. 
You can rely on him. You can depend on him. When you confide in him, you can trust that he will keep your secret. You can trust that he will answer your question. You can trust that he will meet your need. The Bible says you can trust the keeping of your soul onto him as onto a faithful creator. He is faithful. He is true. He's authentic. Then I see secondly in this text, the author of the story. The author of the story. The Christmas season, it's a great reminder to us of who's in control. God is in control. God is on the throne. You you read this story and you realize that there's one man in this text that thinks he's calling the shots. He thinks he's the one on the throne. He thinks that he's the one that everything revolves around him. Think of this. Caesar Augustus. He makes a decree, and the Bible tells us everybody moved because of it. Because of something that he said, the whole Roman world at that time, all men went to be taxed, every man unto his own city. All of them got up and moved because he said so. That's power. (laughs) That's a man in authority. That's a man who his word carries weight. Think of the gravity of that man. Oh, Caesar thinks he's king, but you know what he really is? He's a pawn in the hand of God. You know what a pawn is? You played chess before? (laughs) Chess, those eight little men that really can't do anything. They're the most frustrating men on the chessboard because they really, they just move one space at a time. You know what other piece on the chessboard only moves one space at a time? The king. (laughs) Caesar's just a pawn in the hand of God. He thinks he's the author of this story, but the fact is God's the one writing this thing down. God's the one in control. Think of it. Number one here, he pre-wrote the script. He pre-wrote the script. When we think of these events, let's remember that everything happened exactly as God said it would happen. God pre-wrote this thousand years before, thousands of years before now, before Caesar Augustus came along, five times in the book of Matthew, just counting the Christmas story, just in Matthew chapters one and two, five times, it says something along the lines of, thus it happened as it was spoken of the Lord by the prophets. Thus it happened as God said it would happen. He was born of a virgin, Matthew one twenty three, fulfilling prophecy. He went down into Egypt and came out again, fulfilling prophecy. Even Herod's brutal crimes at Christmas time fulfilled prophecy. Prophets said that he would be a Nazarene. And what about where he was born? Did the Bible say anything about where Jesus would be born? Well, you remember when the wise men came and they asked, asked Herod, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And Herod has no clue, has no idea what the Bible says. He calls the scribes together and asks them where Christ should be born. And they quoted it to him, the Old Testament. They said, in Bethlehem, for thus it is written by the prophets in in Matthew 2, verse 6, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. God's the one that said that Joseph and Mary had to be in Bethlehem for the Savior to be born. God pre-wrote that. And so we see in the text, not only did he pre-write the script, but he prompted their sojourning in Bethlehem. He prompted their trip there. He's the one. Caesar thinks that he's the one that did it. But God got them there. I see in the text that Mary and Joseph, they obviously didn't know. They didn't know where Jesus was to be born. You say, well, he should have known his Bible better. Well, he didn't live in a day like you and I live in, where we all have our own Bible and we can all read it, okay? In those days, uh, not many people had the Bible and not many people could read. And so could Joseph and Mary even read? We have no idea. But it's obvious that he has no inclination to go to Bethlehem on his own. He has no, uh, no, he's not thinking about that. He's not thinking that that's something he needs to do. But 
Don't worry, God's going to take care of that. God's put it in the heart of Augustus, or God somehow worked it out so that Augustus is making this decree, thinking that he is filling his coffers filled with money. But what he's really doing is setting the stage in motion for Joseph and Mary to make a trip to Bethlehem so that they can not pay taxes, but so that's where the Savior would be born. It's fulfilling God's word. Caesar is just a pawn in the hand of God. He says, no, I'm not. I'm the king. I'm the one in the authority. What does the Bible say in Proverbs 21, verse 1? Proverbs 21, verse 1, you can read it if you like, but it says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The Lord's the king of kings and Lord of lords. He calls the shots. It's not to say that everything that ever happens is God's doing. Of course not. But it's to say that God is able to take all these things that happen and work them together for good to them that love God, to them according, called according to his purpose. Was Caesar right in commanding for the taxes? I have no idea, but most likely not. Thinking of Caesar, I can't think of him having done anything that was righteous or right, the right thing to do. He purposed it to fill his own coffers, but God meant it for good. Remember Joseph and his brothers? They sold him, but God sent him. God's the one authoring the story here. He had his plans, but God worked out his. Christmas reminds us that God is in control. You look at the world around us and you say, where's the hope in this world? I read a quote the other day that there are three kinds of people in this world. There's either people that are afraid or there's people who don't know enough to be afraid. <laughs> or there's people who know the Bible. <laughs> you see, this world's a scary place without the Bible, without the word of God. We, we look at it and we say, what's wrong with this world? What's the hope of this world? But praise God, even in dark times, God is still on the throne and he still works things together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We have the authenticity of the story and the author of the story. But then I want you to see last of all this morning, won't be too long, I guess, this morning. See the apathy for the story. Verse 3, we'll just start reading again at verse 3. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, onto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Think of the amazing thing that happens in this text. God sent his son. There you are in Bethlehem. Interestingly enough, Bethlehem means the house of bread. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. There in Bethlehem was the bread of life given for all men. God sent his son. He, he sent the savior of the world. And nobody noticed. Nobody cared. You think of that, you say, well, they, they maybe had no, no way of telling. I mean, it's not like, it's not like uh, they would have necessarily recognized that this is the son of God who's being born. Yeah, but I just don't understand how there can be a lady nine months pregnant having ridden a donkey for 144 kilometers all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem and nobody can make room. Nobody can provide them a, a place to stay. There she has to go out into the stable. Nobody seems to care. Why not? They're too busy busy with their business, trying to make more money to pay more taxes, 
busy with their families. All of David's descendants were there in Bethlehem. And so obviously they were getting together and seeing one another, people they hadn't seen in so long. They were busy uh, with friends and family, busy with plans they already had, too busy to see the need, too busy to, too full, too full to let him in. The Bible says he came into his, onto his own and his own received him not. You know, Christmas time's not changed very much, has it? It's a busy time of year. Somebody says it's the most wonderful time of the year. Someone else says it's the biz busiest time of the year. <laughs> so, so much to do this time of year. Too busy, though, for Jesus. Too busy to make room for him. Too busy to do something for him. Pastor Rockwood used to say, if you're too busy to serve God, you're too busy. <laughs> it's that simple. If you're too busy for him, you're too busy. And yet they were too busy. They were too full. You know, we can have Christmas still without the busyness, can't we? You can have Christmas without decorating too much. You can have Christmas without decorating at all. You can have Christmas without spending all your money on gifts or without having great feasts. You can have Christmas without stockings and without tinsel on the tree. But you can't have Christmas without Jesus. You can't have it without Christ. And yet how many people celebrate it without Christ? Do you know that in Canada, 96% of people celebrate Christmas? 96%. That's pretty close to 100. Even though 14% celebrate Hanukkah, 96% still celebrate Christmas. So we know there's some that just celebrate it to celebrate it. And yet... Oh, the only holiday that comes close is New Year's Eve. 87% of Canadians celebrate New Year's Eve. 96% celebrate Christmas. And uh, yet the vast majority of them are celebrating it without Christ. I think of that first Christmas, and I think of how similar it was to Christmas today. People celebrate Christmas, and uh, you know, back in Bethlehem in Luke chapter 2, they had bills didn't they? They had taxes to pay. Well, in Canada, people have lots of bills at Christmas time. They say the average Canadian plans to spend $1,347 during the 2023 Christmas season. Most Canadians overspent that last, overspent last Christmas. Only 2% actually stick to spending their, up to or less than their budget. 7% of Canadians actually overspent their budget by more than $1,000. And so the bills at Christmas time are big. They had bills in their Christmas time, their taxes. Christmas is a time of travel. Lots of people travel. In Bethlehem, the Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem. Everyone traveled that first Christmas. And people are traveling today, just like back then. They had family get-togethers. Think of all of David's family being together in one place. They would have gotten together. People get together at Christmas time. And so they had visitors. So many visitors that the inns were full. So many visitors, get-togethers, people coming over for that first Christmas. And needless to say, it was a good time for business. Imagine all the money the innkeeper was making in Bethlehem. All the money that the people living there were making as all these people came in from all over the world. And yet, in all their excitement, Jesus Christ was outside, lying in a manger, a feeding trough for the animals. And we think of that first Christmas and the indifference that they had. And we look at Bethlehem and we say, that's, that's inexcusable. You can't lock Jesus outside. And yet, how many people today are apathetic to Jesus? And here in the church, let's remind ourselves, let's not be apathetic towards him. You know, he isn't apathetic towards you. He loves you. The whole reason he came into this world was for you. The whole reason he came was to save sinners of whom I am chief. The whole reason he came was so that he could minister and give his life a ransom for many. The song that Bethany sang says, He knows our need to our weakness is no stranger. He, he 
was made flesh. He, he knows our infirmities. He's touched by with our infirmities. He knows exactly what we're going through. And he cares for us. And he wants to be your friend. He wants to be your savior. Don't be apathetic towards him. I can't imagine being that innkeeper that first Christmas. I mean, we, he's the one we give the hardest time. He missed Jesus. Think of all the, the people walking by and they, they miss that violin player, eh? That's, uh, I, I, I mean, if, if you had to just, you could have listened to him for free at the subway. <laughs> but uh, tomorrow night, it's $100 or whatever to go listen to this man play his violin. Well, there he had Jesus Christ knock at his door. There they were. He was, he was right there, Mary, Joseph, and the Lord Jesus. They were right there ready for, for him to receive him. And yet he had no room. Friend, don't be like that. Make room for Jesus. There's a story by Amos, w, a, Amos K. Wells called the Bethlehem Keeper. He writes of the innkeeper's perspective, and this is what he says. What could be done? The inn was full of folk. His honor, Marcus Lucius and his scribes who made the census, honorable men from farthest Galilee who had come to be enrolled, high ladies and their lords, the rich, the rabbis, such a noble thing Bethlehem had not seen before and may not see again. And there they were, close herded with their servants, till the inn was like a hive at swarming time. And I was fairly crazed among them. That they were so important, just the two you know, servants, just a workman sort of man, leading a donkey and his wife thereon, drooping and pale. I saw them not myself. My servants must have driven them away. But had I seen them, how was I to know? Where inns to welcome stragglers up and down in all our towns from Beersheba to, till, to Dan, till he should come? And how were men to know? There was a sign, they say, a heavenly light resplendent. But I had no time for stars. There were songs of angels in the air, out on the hills, but how was I to hear amid the clamors of an inn? Of course, I had, had I known then who they were and who was he that should be born that night. For now I, I learn that they will make him king, a second David, who will ransom us from these Philistine Romans. Who but he that feeds an army with a loaf of bread? And if the soldier falls, he touches him, and he up he leaps uninjured. Had I known, I would have turned the whole inn upside down. His honor, Marcus Lucius, and the rest, and sent them all to stables, had I known. So if you have seen him, stranger, and perhaps again will see him, please say for me that I did not know. And if he comes again, as he will surely come, with retinue and banners and an army, tell my Lord that all my inn is his to make amends. Alas, alas, to, make a, to miss a chance like that, this inn that might be chief among them all, this birthplace of Messiah, had I known. Jesus was knocking, and he turned him away. You know, in that day, he was knocking on the door of an inn. The Bible says today he's knocking on the door of a church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Today, Jesus is knocking just like he was back then. Only this time, it's up to you. The innkeeper didn't answer the door. But today, will you answer the door? Jesus Christ wants to come in. He wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to spend Christmas with you. I wonder, will you have room for him? Will you make room for the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we've had in your word. Thank you, Lord, for that first Christmas when Jesus came. And Lord, it's such an exciting passage of Scripture to walk through. I'm thankful that we get to look at these 20 verses today, and we only looked at the first seven this morning. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they'll be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.